it's kind of inspiring to me. And that's part of the reason I get so fired up to coach still is that, you know, it's not, you know, don't get me wrong. I hate losing. I, I love winning and, and the competition of it is, is fantastic, but you know, the opportunity to make a positive impression on a, on a, on a player and especially a player I work with like through the course of a couple of seasons, it's, it just gives me a lot of pride and it, it inspires me to keep going. And hey everyone, Brandon Rubio of the Hockey Players Club and Quest Hockey. And today I had the privilege of interviewing Pete Kamen of Elevated Hockey and the Let's Go Hockey podcast. I always enjoy catching up with Pete as he's had such varied hockey experiences, both on the ice and roller courts, whether stateside or in Namibia, India, Spain, Malaysia, China, or wherever he's headed next. He's a great guy who brings a wealth of knowledge and passion for the game which he eagerly shares on his Instagram and podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. Please like and comment your feedback below. Subscribe to our channel and don't forget to download the Hockey Players Club app. So, uh, Pete, thanks for being here today. I know most people recognize you uh, for your coaching contributions to the game, but I'd like to start with when you played. So tell us a little bit about your youth playing days between the two hockey hotbeds in Minnesota and Chicago, but, uh, and also your first impression of competitive roller hockey out in California. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me on, Brandon. It's good to get to connect here and get to talk some hockey, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'd be happy to kind of walk through, like, like you said, I originally from Minneapolis and then, um, but when I was pretty young, I was like, like right around five years old or so I, I moved to Chicago, kind of suburban Chicago. And that's kind of where I, I pretty much started when uh, started playing in Chicago and all of, um, you know, played all my youth hockey in it was a suburb called Barrington, um, played for the Barrington Wings and, and a few other teams for tournaments and things like that. Grew up playing. Uh, and then after I had a little stint where basically my dad got a new job, family moved to Southern California right after um, after eighth grade. So I started high school over in Southern California. Um, played there out of a, you know, like a travel team out of uh, Anaheim for, for the three years I was there. And then um, and then I jumped back to Chicago, just family moved back to Chicago. It wasn't like a hockey related move necessarily, but I moved back to the same city and jumped back in for my senior year uh, on the local high school team with my same group of buddies I grew up skating with. So that was kind of a cool a cool thing. But uh, yeah, that three year, year stint in California is kind of where I, I um in addition to playing ice hockey, I, roller hockey at the time, this was in the late nineties. They, uh, it was kind of like the, the height of, of hockey, uh, roller hockey kind of across the country and Southern California seemed to be kind of the big hub of it. So moved out there and the, uh, my local high school didn't have an ice hockey team, but it did have like a varsity JV and freshman roller hockey team, which like blew my mind at the time. Cause I'd never played or anything. And so I just went out for the team and played and uh, got into it. And then I got into the kind of the Narch tournament, series as well and so the whole three years I was there I was just balancing ice and roller which was uh for me I loved it you know I played lacrosse as well but those were kind of my two main focuses and just played a ton a ton of of hockey whether it was on ice or roller the whole time I was there that's awesome was uh the pro beach hockey going strong at that time it was I actually (laughs) yeah the (laughs) the ramps behind the nets and everything I know um so the funny story was my uh my high school roller hockey coach was also involved in that league and I tried so hard to get in on it and uh, <laughs> I was uh I was either 16 or 17 but like I couldn't they wouldn't let me play because I wasn't 18 like I for uh, whatever reason um but I was like trying so hard to get in on that when uh, when I was in high school <laughs> yeah, I, w- I would love for someone to bring that back I don't know how it happened but they have was it two point goals or like three point goals if you scored from a certain distance or something like that as well I think so yeah I remember something like that where there was guys just you know pulling three pointers from behind the red and stuff. <laughs> it's just kind of I mean it was ridiculous but it was, it was fun and you know got on ESPN and um yeah, you know, still however many years, 20 some years later, we're still talking about it. So it made an impression, even though it was kind of a, you know, a gimmicky thing. It was still pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of fun to watch, no doubt. But uh, like you mentioned, you ended up moving back to Chicago for your senior year and debated pursuing, you know, playing junior hockey versus um, going to school right away, which I think is a situation what probably hundreds of players across U.S. and Canada um, find themselves in every year. How did you navigate and ultimately come to the decision to head to Miami of Ohio? Yeah, you know, when I was, uh, it kind of started first when I was like a junior in high school and started thinking about college hockey and what was that path going to look like. And 
Um, at the time, my first priority was I, I was just really excited to play for my school because I didn't have the opportunity to do that when I was in California because it was like a, a, an independent club. And so when I when I moved back to Chicago, I had an opportunity to play for a for a AAA team there, but I, I I I didn't even look into it more than just like one conversation with with a coach. But it was uh, it was right out of the gates. I was just so pumped to play for my high school. And so then when that when that came to the end of that season and I started looking at what were those next steps, um, you know, I was pretty realistic that I was not I really wasn't cut out to be a, a Division One player. Um, but I thought I was like, you know, if I really pursue this, I, I think I would have a shot at, I think I could, I could go a D3 level. That was kind of where I was thinking my, my top end was. And so with that, you know, my opportunities were, I talked with a couple of D3 schools and, and it was like, yeah, we, you know, like we'll give you a, a like a walk on tryout or you can go play juniors for like two years and, and we'll keep in touch and we'll see how you do. And so it was pretty, when I started doing all the college campus visits, kind of getting a feel for all the different paths. Um, Miami of Ohio stuck out as like the number one school I wanted to go to. And I just, it was just one of those things, like I stepped on campus and it felt right. And I was like, this is where I need to go. And, um, you know, it's, it's a D1 school. So hockey was kind of out of the picture, but like, that's where I wanted to go. And, um, and so when it came down to it, I had that, it, it kind of came down to a decision where I had a, the junior team that I wanted to play for, um, had its its main camp. It was the the Bozeman Ice Dogs, which is the city I live in now, because I had a tie here to Montana and I wanted to live here. This is the team I wanted to play for. So they had a tryout camp, and then they had a. This, it was like the same week or weekend as the like early freshman orientation for Miami Ohio. And so it was kind of like the exact fork in the road where <laughs> I really had to make a decision. I was like, do I want to go play juniors for two years, two to three years? and grind it out to try to land, you know, somewhere to p play hockey in college, or do I want to just say, you know what, like, let's, let's go to college. Um, and ultimately my gut told me that, um, that just going to college was the right route for me. And, and so I did. And then at the time I actually didn't even know much about the, the club team at Miami, the it was ACHA uh, team. And I ended up trying out for that. And that's a whole nother long story, but I ended up making, I got hurt in tryouts. Um, and didn't complete tryouts. And then I ended up getting, being the last person cut from the team and talked to the coach. And he said, well, once you heal up and when you heal up, we'll give you three practices. And so I came out and I did those three practices about a month later and then like signed on and then played, played after that. And, uh, and it turned out that was my, my freshman year. And that was the year we won nationals. And so, it, you know, like retrospectively, you know, I, I think I made the right decision going to school versus juniors, but that was kind of my, my big conflict or fork in the road of trying to figure out, do I pursue hockey or do I go to school? And as it turns out, I went to school and ended up doing more hockey than I even did. So it all worked out. What were your first impressions of the ACHA level in Miami? It was, uh, it, it was way beyond what I ever, uh, anticipated. And, uh, you know, and even back then, I mean, that was, a, uh, you know, I'm, that was a while ago when I played, um, but so for any, I'm a huge proponent of the ACHA and the, if anybody doesn't know, is not familiar with that level, like the first impression, oh, it's just club hockey. But the reality is for like 90% of the teams, it's not just club hockey. Like it's legit hockey. And the guys that are, I played with at Miami, I mean, we had six guys who had, um, division one experience that like came down from the varsity team. We had half our team had played junior hockey. The other half played, you know, Minnesota high school or, or competitive, you know, like I did in Chicago or, you know, other high school programs or, or double A or triple A programs. And it's the same thing now. I mean, I think that people are shocked when they see the talent level of, especially the top tier teams in division one and division two, um, the ones that are a little more organized. I mean, you'd be hard pressed to, so many of the teams operate just like a varsity program. And I think that, you know, every program has its own hurdles and, and benefits and obstacles, but the reality is that ACHA is like, it blows my mind how good some of these players are and they're not in the NCAA route. Yeah. You know, I couldn't agree more. I don't know if you're familiar. I actually played the ACHA level at Penn state, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, prior to Mr. Pagola's very generous donation that has built the whole new building and everything. But uh, yeah, we had multiple guys on our team that either we had, our goalie was from UMass Amherst. Uh, we had a forward from air force, my business partner, Matt, whom you met at the let's, let's play hockey expo. He played at Bentley for a couple of years. Um, I think, I know it surprised me big time when I went there um, after my last year of junior, I kind of expected it to be, 
uh, I don't know what you, when you hear the word club, I guess, maybe what that term kind of brings to mind, I thought it'd be a little more recreational and man, was I wrong when I got to those first practices and workouts, but, uh, pleasantly surprised, no doubt about it, but by the level of hockey. And I think it's just amazing too, with how many teams there are, how many people it provides opportunities to play, like you said, for their school, um, you know, in college where maybe otherwise they wouldn't have that opportunity. Yeah. And I think that it's, uh, it's, it's, I think opportunity is the, the, the big word there because, you know, for, like I'm coaching an ACHA team now, um, you know, and we're trying to, trying to keep improving every season and the players that I've got playing for me are, are fantastic. I mean, we've got a lot of, you know, kids from Minnesota high school, AAA programs, kids from the North American league and the USPHL, um, you know, it's some prep school kids and it, the, the level is fantastic, but you know, the best thing about it is it's the opportunity to not only represent their school, but keep playing and the opportunity to have that locker room camaraderie that you just don't get outside of hockey. And so for like a kid coming to like where I coach Montana state, which is like not on anyone's radar I'm from a hockey scene. Right. But like mm -hmm. for, you know, we have 60, some 60, 70 kids try out for those 25 to 30 spots every year. And wow. for the, those like 20, you, I think, I think next year we're taking like 28 kids this year we had 30. Um, you know, that's an opportunity for them to have like the best friends of their lives from in that yeah. life and play competitive hockey. And like, we're traveling all over the West. Like we were at nationals last year. We're hoping to go back next year. Like it's an opportunity to keep playing at, and it's, it's not like, yes, any one of those 30 kids that skate for me, you know, like it's not just club hockey. Like that's the NHL for those kids. And they treat it that way. Like they sacrifice a lot in school, like, you know, they'll sacrifice partying and going to, you know, whatever on the weekends or time with girlfriends and, or, and, you know, we're on the bus and we're, we're traveling, we're playing hockey and, and we're all kind of uh, having a blast together. So I think it's, it's a pretty cool opportunity. And, and like you said, there's, I think there's like just shy of 400 teams nationally between all the men's and women's levels. It's, I mean, it's a huge animal that a lot of people just underestimate. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. Um, like you mentioned, your freshman year, you actually win a national championship at that level. What what did you learn? Like, what, what was special about that team, and that maybe you learned as part of being part of it, being a championship team that you've taken with you, both maybe as a player, but anything that maybe you're trying to instill or recreate with uh, the teams you coach now? Yeah, I think you know we were pretty fortunate looking back in that we had a. Um, those first two years I played there, I mean, we had great coaches the whole time I was there, but we had one coach there for the first two years. Um, Barry Schutte is his name. He's currently uh, the coach for the Miami division one team, the associate head coach. Uh, but he left our team to go coach in the USHL, which kind of shows the level of coaching yeah. we got at that time. Um, but, you know, I, I try to mimic a lot of my coaching philosophy off of my experience um, in that, that freshman year and, and the year after. And um, what comes to mind with me is really like, accountability and sacrifice um, to our teammates like that was the most close-knit group of guys I'd ever skated with um, and you know I, I don't I don't think you know I don't think we were necessarily the most talented team at nationals by any means um, you know obviously we were good enough to get there and stuff but I think I think the kind of like the intangible of the closeness of the locker room kind of won out in all those close games we had so many last you know buzzer beaters and you know little one goal games that we just that little extra effort from taking the extra hit or making that extra play and it went a long ways. And I think, you know, we just had our 20 year reunion of that, that team. And um, I think it was something like over 90% of the guys flew from all over the world, literally guys from internationally came in to, to meet up for, for two nights back at Miami. And, you know, we, we've got like a group chat going and uh, we meet up for like zoom, zoom uh, cocktail hour, like, you know, once every month and a half or so. And, you know, so still 20 years later, like, like these are some of my best friends still. And I think that that was a big takeaway from that year is like we just the, the team was just so close knit that like we didn't really care what we were doing or what, who we were playing because we always we were just so accountable to each other to do it. I think that was something that the coach instilled in us. Yeah, it's so interesting, too, because last week I um, sat down with Tober Scott. I don't know if you're familiar with him at all. Uh, he yeah. played it and coached at Cornell. And he had a team in I think it was 2005. They won the ECAC championship. I asked him a similar question. and He gave. I mean, a very, very similar response I was really? talking about when you have that tight knit group and people that I mean, you can rely on one another and expect that the other person will, you know, sacrifice their body to block a shot or uh, help a teammate out in need. And, and he said the exact same thing about having a group chat with these guys, you know, 10, <laughs> 15 years later. Um, 
and I don't I don't find that to be a coincidence at all. I look back at some of the championship teams I've been fortunate to be a part of, and there's just something about um, I don't know that family bond that you end up creating in that locker room, and just some of the the battles you have in practice and or in games together um, that just bring you so close. And I think you know in those tough moments when you got to dig deep, uh, you can trust you can trust the guys you know, on the bench, you know, and on the ice with you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that's a, that's a huge, huge part of, uh, you know, like creating a championship team is, is developing that bond and accountability. Uh, so I'm a big believer in that. I try to, as much as possible, I try to create an environment that can foster that with our, our players now. And, you know, like I think my, my team now is, is, is making strides toward that. I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're really, really close. And, you know, whether that translates to a championship or, or not, I don't know, but, um, you know, like I can see a lot of similarities in the team that coach now because those guys are like family with each other from top yeah. to bottom of the roster. Like all 28 or 30 guys like are like best buddies. Like they don't go anywhere without each other. So it's I, I see a lot of similarities in that, which is really like it gets me fired up as a coach. You know, like I it, I love it. It's inspiring for me. Yeah. And they're like their own little frat, you know, <laughs> um, exactly. by the time you graduate. Uh, for Miami, not only did you play obviously on the ACHA team, you started the roller program there, if I'm not mistaken. I did. Uh, and, yeah. and then you were also an assistant coach with the ACHA team your last semester. Uh, yeah. Clearly, I mean, you have to love the game to be part of it in all of those facets. Um, but upon graduating, you decided to move to Bozeman, Montana. And from what it sounds like in your conversation with your podcast co-host, uh, Danny Heath, maybe just going out there for to be a ski bum for a year or two. Uh, but in the process, you're approached by Pat LaFontaine's brother, John LaFontaine, if I'm not mistaken, yep. uh, to help the local high school team. So how did that opportunity come about? Yeah. So I, I kind of always have had growing up, I have family ties to Montana. So we used to always vacation, like visiting cousins and aunts and uncles and stuff out here. So when I was at Miami, I, I would spend my summers uh, out here, actually. Like I would drive from Chicago, like Miami to Chicago, see family, drive to Minneapolis, see some hockey teammates. And then I would shoot over to Montana and I would I would work here all summer long and then go back to Miami. So when I when I graduated, uh, I came out here instead of taking like a real job, I, I wanted to because I graduated in four and a half years. Um, so that last semester I graduated in December. So I moved out here in January and basically just was like, I'm going to ski for three months and just ski and bartend and like, you know, take, take some, like kind of like a gap year, but like, I'm going to take three months and just kind of blow off steam and do whatever. And then I'll get a real job after that. And that turned into me just live. I've lived out here ever since, you know, like I ended up, you know, getting the real job out here and all that. Um, <laughs> But in that, you know, like I brought my gear and I was just playing in the uh, in the adult league, in the beer league here in town. And I had my Miami helmet and uh, John LaFontaine was the hockey director, the youth hockey director and the um, the head coach of the Bozeman Ice Dogs Junior A team at the time. I think they're in the N.A. Uh, at that time. And he saw my Miami helmet. Well, he was a graduate of Miami as well. <laughs> Um, so he grabbed me and was like, hey, where'd you get that helmet? And I told I just kind of told him real quick and. And then he, he, there's another guy on my team was who had just kind of wrapped up playing juniors a couple years before from Saskatchewan. And, uh, he grabbed the two of us and kind of pulled us aside and, and basically just asked us to, to be his assistants for the high school program. Because what happened was that the, because he was youth director, he's auto, like automatically the head high school coach, but he's also the head coach of the junior team. So he could run all the practices and get the kids ready. But then when there was games, like half the games, he wasn't able to be at because he had to be with the junior team on the road. So right. he basically was like, you know, I'll take care of everything. I'll teach you guys how to coach. Um, you guys just shag pucks for me and like, we'll, we'll be a team on the ice. And then you guys will be the two of you guys will be head coaches together on the, on the road games. But then he was there really able to be there for the home games. <clears throat> so yeah, that was kind of like my first, like, you know, I had a semester as being an assistant in Miami and then I went kind of right into the, the high school hockey here and did that for a couple of seasons and had a, it was a pretty cool opportunity because John is a, you know, he's a, a fantastic guy. It's been a few years since I talked to him, but he, you know, he left Bozeman to go be the athletic director and coach at Shattuck. And uh, he was back in the USHL for a while. And I think he's coaching a, um, last I heard, I think he was maybe in Detroit for a coaching a prep school program there. But uh, yeah, I mean, he was a fantastic, prof you know, professional level coach. He'd coached NCAA D1 before, before here. And so I got to see how he worked on a daily basis, how he, you know, mentally what he was doing to, 
prepare for practice, like what he, his thoughts were with different drills and different sequences and progressions. And, you know, it was just an awesome, awesome learning experience. Like just, you know, tap into his mind for, for that, that first season. Yeah, it sounds like it. And I know you've said that he put a lot of emphasis on character development, not just skill development and X and O. So like teaching these kids to be good men, not just good hockey players. Um, how has that impacted your style or maybe even how you view the role of being a coach? Yeah, I think, you know, my, my opportunity with, with John was the first time uh, I'd really seen that in, in, in practice where he like very deliberately spoke like directly to, um, you know, teaching the, the players how to become good men and good husbands and good fathers uh, and told them that like, hey, we're going to do this because, you know, you may not like this decision, but we're going to do this because later in life, like this is the kind of th things that are going to be, you know, they're going to make you a better father one day and stuff like that. And so he was very intentional in that. And I think that, like I said, it was the first time I'd really seen it in practice from a coaching level. And I think it was such a huge takeaway for me to see like, not just, especially coming out of playing pretty quickly, like to step beyond the like X's and O's and the wins and losses and, and <clears> see like, what a positive impact some of the coaches can like a good coach can have such a huge positive impact on a player's life. And I think that was the first time I like really like critically thought about it. And, uh, you know, so for me, it, it's, you know, he and I, John and I have a little different approaches in how we do that. But, but my takeaway for that was that like, I think that's just, it's kind of inspiring to me. And that's part of the reason I get so fired up to coach still is that, you know, it's not, you know, don't get me wrong. I hate losing. I, I love winning and, and the competition of it is, is fantastic, but you know, the opportunity to make a positive impression on a, on a, on a player and especially a player I work with like through the course of a couple of seasons it's it just gives me a lot of pride and it, it inspires me to keep going it's kind of like the addictive part of coaching for me where it's it's just it's just something I really love and that was kind of the first taste of it I had was was watching John do that yeah that's great I mean I know I I do believe that as I've gotten gotten older I think the game is really such a vehicle to learn all kinds of life lessons as long as you're you know being observant and paying attention there's so many things that we learn uh, playing the game that apply to all kinds of things and being successful. So uh, makes a lot of sense and really cool to hear. But before you started um, elevated hockey and the coaching Montana state, I know you had the opportunity to be a hockey director and the head coach of 12 roller hockey teams in <laughs> Namibia. So how does one learn of and apply for an opportunity to coach in Namibia? And uh, what was the hockey community like there? Yeah. I mean, it was kind of like uh so it just, it was, it was such a wild occurrence. Um, you know, I was coaching the Bozeman high school team at the time. I think it was my second year coaching. So it was the year after with John. With, um, so I was coaching the high school program and basically, I mean, it's a, it's a really long story, but the, the short version is there's a, a gentleman from Montana, excuse me, that uh, goes there every year on a like half medical mission where he brings a bunch of doctors and nurses um, and they do some rural medicine out in, in the, in the bush and then and then they'll stay for like an extra week and do like the safari thing and see animals and go hunting and you know whatever they do so when he was there he one of the lodge owners had a kid who played on this roller hockey program and basically said hey like we need to find a coach all the other teams in the country there's only five programs in the country but four of them had been importing international coaches from europe and one from canada and then the the program I took over was, was the only parent run program at the time. And they basically said, you know, like, Hey, we're getting, the gap is getting too big. We don't want to like lose, like we're losing too bad. And we don't, we want to keep our program strong. So we need to find an international coach and we don't know how to do it. And the guy was like, well, I'm from the U S like, I'll find you a coach. And, uh, <laughs> and so he called my uncle, like my uncle played high school hockey in Minnesota back, you know, whenever in the sixties or whatever. And he's like, he called my uncle and was like, Hey, you used to play hockey. Do you know any hockey coaches? And he was like, yeah, my, I think my nephew coaches. And so like, and then from there I got in touch with him. I ended up, you know, committing to the job and, and it was kind of interesting because it was, it was roller hockey and I had, I hadn't played roller hockey in a couple of, couple of years, but you know, I had the experience in California and at Miami and, um, and I, I basically just, you know, I was young and single and didn't have any uh, commitments at the time. And so I, I literally said yes. And I think within two weeks or so, I had everything I owned in a storage unit and I, my a backpack and a, my hockey bag and sticks. And I was on a plane to Africa. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up spending a year there. I almost stayed longer. I kind of I, I wanted to. But uh, I, I ended up being there for a year. 
and coach, yeah, I was head hockey director and head coach to 12 teams. And I was a player coach on, on their, their like top team, which was like mostly all college kids and a couple of the, the older high school kids. And it, but it was, it was awesome. I mean, I think there was, like I said, there's five programs in the country and the way it operated, like I would run practice Monday through Thursday after the kids got out of school. And then Friday and Saturday, Sunday, they would like go home to their their ranches or wherever they lived and like the farms and then because we were in kind of mine was kind of a rural uh area outside of the cities so the kids would go back to the farms with their families and stuff and then uh but we would only play games like once every six weeks or so and every wow. hockey player in the entire country would come together for these massive like four-day festivals and so you know for like five weeks in a row i'd have like three-day weekends just to explore africa and just kind of experience what was going on and then every like fifth or sixth week we'd have this massive massive tournament where i would coach like 80 some games in like four days and <laughs> including playing in like four or five and it was like from like six in the morning till midnight or two in the morning playing you know coaching all through and then doing it again like thursday through sunday and uh but it, the it, the community was fantastic because there's I don't know maybe five six hundred players in the in the country, and everybody's together at these these complexes and it's just a big like celebration of hockey. Everyone's so passionate about it. Like it was just amazing. It was such a cool culture that it's it's hard to put into words. But it was such a great experience, and they just like ad, like adopted me into their culture so quickly that it was. Uh, I mean, it's been like over it's about ten years ago, and I'm still in touch with a lot of those players and parents and and the other coaches too like there's only five of us coaches in, in the country and we you know we all kind of kept in touch and you know with one of them I still talk to all the time so wow that sounds like an amazing experience did you get to see any uh other hockey around Africa at all while you're over yeah, there you know, I, uh a little bit like I I um I know you know there's ice rinks down in South Africa uh mm -hmm. I never had an opportunity to go check those out but i know that there's a few uh, but i went on one this is like the craziest thing i went on a road trip we had a break and i went to uh mound botswana and in mound it's like right at the mouth of the okavango delta it's like kind of a touristy area but not really like it's pretty rural uh and i got word that there is this guy from toronto that like basically lived there with him and his family and had was such a hockey nut that he was like trying to start hockey in this tiny little town in Botswana. So like I spent like two days searching this guy out and I found him and just knocked on his door. But he had built like a concrete uh, roller hockey rink in his backyard, like wow. with concrete boards, like, or it was like, like concrete boards. He can't have wooden boards because of the termites. So it's like a concrete <laughs> rink with like, like stadium seating and stuff. And he called it the tequila cup, like every Saturday night he would call, do the tequila cup and it was just a giant party and anyone was <laughs> to play, but it, so there's like a mix of like lots of expats who knew how to play and also just locals and other expats that didn't know how to play and they would all come together make teams and they called themselves the mukwa leafs and they would play these <laughs> massive like these like barbecue party hockey tournament things and then every now and like once a year once every two years they'd feel like their, their all-star team of the least, and they would come and play in like one tournament in Namibia, which is how I kind of tracked them down. But it was, it was unreal. That was like my only yeah. other person. It was like, I was like, it was like fantasy land. Like I could, I was like, this is the most bizarre, awesome <laughs> thing I've ever seen. <laughs> that is super cool. One of the most uh, unique hockey stories I've definitely ever heard. That's for sure. <laughs> um, so after that year though, you do head back to Montana and you're actually getting team coaches and youth teams and you eventually get asked to provide extra on ice instruction for some players preparing for prospects and other tryout camps, which is when it sounds like elevated hockey is more or less essentially born. Uh, what were your initial goals with elevated hockey and how have things evolved over the years? Yeah. So my initial, like you touched on, you know, it started on the ice as postseason camps. Um, so Montana has, a, we don't have year round ice. A lot of the rinks shut down. Um, but so for our like top percentage players that want to have go into like USA hockey camps or national camps or go to tryouts for AAA teams outside of the, the state, you know, they're, they're at a real disadvantage if they can't get on the ice for five mm -hmm. weeks leading up to that tryout camp. So what we were doing was, was organizing those top couple of kids that the top maybe like 10 or 15 kids around the state and coming together 
for like weekend development camps um, wherever there was ice. So like whether it's where I am or a couple hours away, we were doing like building out a schedule to get these kids prepped to go to like North Dakota to compete against the top North Dakota kids for the trial spots for the nationals, uh, national camps. So that was kind of the first thing. And I just kind of like, you know, for, I just branded it elevated hockey and, and, and incorporated it. And that was the start of it. Then I started documenting the, like taking videos uh, initially to show the kids. Cause it was like, I'm a big fan of showing video to the kids just so they can see what they're doing right or wrong. And, and just another way of teaching. So then I started taking those, um those video clips uh and i just started an instagram page like i was seeing a bunch of other coaches doing it and it kind of i was like oh i like initially it was just for me to be like this would be a kind of a cool like bank of a combination of like drills that i'm doing drills that i see other coaches doing and i like and then also like just documenting my hockey travels or like my hockey experience what i'm doing and so initially it was just kind of for me to to do that like as a as a big like bank of, of info. And then it kind of just started taking off. I think back then that was like three, a little over three years ago. And like, there weren't that many coaches doing it. Like I was, there's definitely coaches doing it. Like I was not the first by any means. There's a lot of people doing it, but there weren't that many. And, mm-hmm. and I think for whatever reason, um, it just kind of took off. And so I got, kind of got a, a following kind of quick, like quicker than I ever would have imagined. And then that just kind of blossomed into, doing more and more and people are, you know, contacting me for advice or drills or, you know, whatever. And so I, I just kind of kept, kept it going and, and kept doing more. And it, it, you know, as I, as I did more and more in it, it kind of more opportunities were presenting themselves. And so I kind of have been, it's kind of morphed into what it is now where I just kind of, kind of keep doing it. And the whole, the whole goal now is to, you know, what started off as a personal kind of just memory bank. Uh, the goal now is just to kind of share a, a passion for the game and, and try to, help inspire and, and, and give any, any bit of knowledge that might help somebody out there, you know, whether they're, they're a young player or coach or, or anybody else. Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's certainly, I know how you and I initially connected was, I know I found you on Instagram. It's just really cool that we have these platforms now to be able to share this stuff. And I do want to get more into uh, some of the other projects you have coming on and sharing all that knowledge, but I did want to ask about, um, you know, your, your time at Montana state, um, you know, how have you enjoyed coaching the college level? Because again, I know you, you know mostly we're doing coaching youth um, players. How do you enjoy coaching at the college level? And is there any unique challenge you maybe have, you know, coaching say college guys versus squirts or peewees? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's two different animals, that's for sure. But uh, you know, the, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences too. I mean, the biggest, ch- a couple of the challenges we have now. Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, I just, I love it. You know, like I, I, I didn't expect to love coaching youth hockey and I got into it and I absolutely loved it. And then, you know, and I was like, well, I'll just keep doing this. I, I probably won't get back into the higher level because this is kind of works well with my lifestyle and whatever. And then kind of things changed and I, and I decided to start getting involved with the college team. And, and for me, it's like a fantastic competitive outlet because it's, it's the highest level of hockey in Montana, you know, for where I live and where I choose to live. And, it's the highest level that's available and, and the, it's fantastic kids that are here. And so for me, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. Um, and, you know, coaching those, those kids, they're like we talked about earlier, like it's not just club hockey. They're so passionate about it and they work so hard uh, and they compete so hard. Um, but at the end of the day, like they're, they're young adults too. Like there's, you know, like our team last year, our youngest player was 18 and our oldest was 26. So like, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot different coaching a 26 year old man than it is you know, like a, a, an eight year old squirt. Right. Um, <laughs> so you coach a little bit differently and, and the, the level of knowledge is, is much higher, obviously. So you can get into some more advanced strategies and tactics, which I love, um, you know, and th- there's some hurdles with like, you know, financial hurdles with, you know, the university doesn't really support financially support the program. So we have to come up with a pretty big budget on our own. Um, you know, then there's the, the, there's always the, you know, the academic side of things. Like we got to make sure our kids are getting enough time to study and are keeping their grades up. And, 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 you know, cause they're student athletes. They're not just there to play hockey. They've got to keep their grades up and, and get that degree. And, um, you know, and a few other challenges with just, you know, on the road. And, uh, luckily we have a good, a bunch of good group of kids, but at the end of the day, they're still college kids and got to kind of keep a leash on them a little bit when we're on the, uh, on the road <laughs> to keep them out of trouble. But, uh, 
you know, like, like I said, we got a good group of guys, so it's not too much of a concern, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of dynamics that are very different coaching a college game than, than the, the youth game, but, you know, I, I just love it. It's, I'm passionate about it. And, you know, and then there's the recruiting aspect too, which is a whole nother level. Like that's something I've been doing the last couple of seasons that I, you know, you know, I didn't ever really, I never recruited for youth hockey, but right. we're recruiting now for the college hockey team in, you know, that, that one or two players every year, that's that missing piece that we're trying to find. And, you know, on top of the, the players that just come to school and try out. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting moving pieces to it. I, it's, it's a fun project. I'm sure. And I know your role within USA hockey is ever expanding. And um, you've had the opportunity, opportunity to coach at the U15 national festival for a few years now, if I'm, if I'm correct. Um, yeah. how would you compare the 15 year old players that you're seeing today to, to like when we were growing up? You know what we? I mean, I don't know. Can't speak for you. I was 15 in '99, <laughs> uh, and I, I'm, you know, just seeing the youth game now. It, it's definitely a little different from back then. Yeah, I mean the it, it, across the board, but especially like the the 15 camp is is like magnified because it's the, for anyone that's not aware, like the USA Hockey Select 15 camp is like I think it's the top 220 or 230 players in the U.S. And so like the skill level and the speed of those kids and the size of those kids is unbelievable, but mostly the skill, like the things these kids are doing and the way they think the game, even at 15 years old, like blows me away that these kids, like, it's just unbelievable. And, and, and again, these are like the top kids were like at 15, 16, they're already like, you know, locks for, for D one scholarships. And, and there's, you know, a handful of them are, projected to be you know first or second round draft picks when they turn 18 a couple years down the road if they keep progressing and um so but yeah i mean if, if i had to pick out one thing like the skill level blows me away compared to what it was back when i played or maybe i just was like so much worse than i realized back then. <laughs> <laughs> no i hear you i mean i, I have a couple clients now that play for uh the pens the pens elite here in pittsburgh and i've gone to a couple of the games this past year and uh it's it's pretty mind blowing to watch. Like I was watching some 14 year olds and yes, yeah, some 15 year olds actually, and two different games and both games just to see the consistency of the talent too. You know, like I feel like when, when I was growing up, maybe certain teams had a, a line or a handful of guys that were really, really good. And they kind of stood head and shoulders above everybody else. But now the consistency of talent at that level is just really impressive. And not just the skill, but even just the way they're thinking the game. It's pretty exciting to see. And it's definitely come a long way. Yeah, like some of the plays these kids pull out. And like not even just like individual stuff. Like the individual creativity is off the charts for so many of them. But like the way that they're thinking the game collectively, like the plays and the cycles and the... It, it's just like, you know, it, it's so much higher level than it was when I played. <laughs> yeah. So maybe I just played too low of a level, but... Uh, <laughs> Like it's, it, it blows my mind, like the, the scrimmage, cause like the national camp is, is there's a lot of stuff going on in every day, but you're on the ice twice a day, one practice, um, two teams, one practice. And then those same two teams play each other that actually you play the game in the morning and then you, you practice at night. But, uh, it, the games are crazy cause they're so fast. And, and like I said, the, the creativity and like the thinking of some of these kids is just off the charts. And so those games are wild because you know, it's, it's also, it's the best, you know, 40 of the best kids in the U S all playing together, which is, you know, especially seeing them that they've never, a lot of them have never played together, never met. And then like, just like that, they're, they're, they're doing these ridiculous plays that, you know, there's, there's minimal coaching in those environments. It's just letting the kids play to see what they do and seeing what they come up with without any coaching is, is awesome. It's pretty cool to see. And especially I feel like in that setting too, where, I mean, let's call a spade a spade. This is a big opportunity for them as young prospects. Oh, so you sure. want to absolutely lay everything out in the line. So when you get to see games, that's why I always love like the world juniors too, where these guys are, you know, just everything they have, uh, they're going to be putting into the game. So I'm sure it's a, a, a lot of fun to be a part of. Um, I know you recently launched your let's go hockey podcast alongside Danny, Danny Heath from project hockey. How did you guys come up with the idea and what's uh, the goal of the podcast? Yeah. So that's kind of our, our new, new project here in the last couple of weeks. So it all kind of started like, you know, like I've, I've always got a lot of irons in the fire for, for hockey, like, you know, doing a lot of different things, like, like a lot of people out there, but uh, the podcast world was something that was really interesting to me. And I, and I wanted to get it started. I tried to get one started like 
almost two years ago, year and a half ago. And I just couldn't, I just couldn't get legs under it. Like I just never launched it never did it. Um, so it was kind of always on the back burner and, uh, and was bugging me. And then I, I ended up meeting, um, meeting Danny initially through Instagram. And then we crossed paths like in real life a couple of times. And, you know, then there was one time we, we sat down for coffee when I was, I was in Minnesota and uh, visiting family and, and he, he, that's where he lives. Um, so we met up for coffee. It was supposed to be like a half hour meeting. And it was like two and a half hours later, like we, we went and I was like, man, that guy's, that guy's awesome. Like he thinks the game so in such a cool way, like we should do something. And I threw that out to him. I was like, you know, I, I've had this podcast idea. I've wanted to start for a long time. Like maybe you and I should do it together and that'll give it legs. And, um, and he was all in, you know, he's, he's, there's a reason he calls himself Danny hype. He just gets all fired up and he's got a lot. <laughs> so he, yeah. But yeah, I mean, so initially, you know, he and I just were like, let's just do this and we'll figure it out and we'll go. Um, and the goal of it was really like an extension of of what he's doing on Instagram, and what I'm doing on Instagram. But like, really, it's just trying to, you know, I always say like my goal is to like share a passion for the game and inspire and, and hopefully educate anybody that's that's interested in, in finding information. And Danny always says that his goal is to leave the game a little bit better than he found it. And so like together, you know, we're both trying basically to do the same thing with what we're doing in hockey. And the podcast is kind of a manifestation of that where we're, we're trying to, it's all focused on development and, and sharing stories about people's paths and their thoughts on different development topics. And so, um, you know, our goal is basically just to get some positive information out there, give back to the game because it's been good to both of us and, um, and just share some stories and, and, you know, hopefully entertain along the way, but really just get some, uh, you know, positive development ideas out there into the world that will hopefully help the game and, and help, you know, if it helps a couple of players and then, then that's great. Um, I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do is, is help share some knowledge and, and share experience with people, not necessarily our, our perspective, but the, the guests that we bring on and their, um, their perspective on, on, on the game of hockey and, and development. So that's kind of where we did. And then we, we kind of crossed paths with our, our third partner, Vinny there, um, who's, who's in the Pittsburgh area as well. And Vinny has been helping us out kind of behind the scenes and he kind of, he is an audio background as a big hockey guy. And so he's kind of the three of us have been, been plugging away at it and it's kind of a fun new project. That's awesome. And it sounds like it's not only a good resource for players, but maybe even some other coaches who are trying to expand their knowledge and, and perspective of the game. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, that's, uh, you know, when we were first, before we ever recorded our first episode, um, you know, we kind of laid it out of like, you know, I want this to be viewed as, you know, hopefully people will like it and, and viewed as a, a potential resource for uh, players, coaches, and parents. And that's, um, you know, so it's kind of geared that. So like, it's probably geared towards coaches of any level. Uh, players, we kind of, we kind of think of that, that like bantam to junior level where they're trying to figure out how to make the next steps. And then hockey parents of any level, just to try to you know get more information because I know where 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 I come from, there's not really a or, you know not where I come from, but where I am now in Montana, there's a limited history of hockey. Like generationally, there's not a lot of like second, third, fourth generation hockey players. So there's a lot of first time hockey players whose parents just don't know anything about the game other than their kids love it. And so um, my my hope is to be able to provide a resource to those those players and parents and you know, hopefully first time coaches or any coaches that want to listen to. That's great. Um, so I know you've now had the opportunity to coach in Spain, China, Malaysia, Namibia, as we've already discussed. I'm sure these are all unique and great experiences in their own, but uh, any of those countries surprise you with, I don't know, with their passion for the game compared to another? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, there's probably a common thread uh, between all of these like kind of non places you wouldn't think that hockey is at, but it is. And it's the people are just so passionate and they, they sacrifice so much to like let their kids play or to be involved in the game. Um, and all those countries you mentioned, like they're diff totally different circumstances. Right. Um, and, and like you never would expect to like have this thriving hockey community in Namibia, Africa, or like this, like th the community I've gotten involved with in Malaysia is like unbelievable. They're like some of the best people I've ever met. And they're so passionate about getting their kids playing. And, um, you know, they, they've got these ice rinks in, in shopping malls and that's where their ice rinks are. And that's, they, they play in these shopping malls whenever they can. And it, the skill level is, is going through the roof. And, um, but the one place that's probably, you didn't mention that is probably takes the cake. Like I love all those places. And I hope to keep being able to participate in hockey in all those places. 
but um the place that like blew me away was when i had an opportunity to go coach in india and that was like oh i didn't i didn't even find that one online you're in <laughs> india <laughs> so i i i had an opportunity to go to india <laughs> um for hockey I, I, there's a hockey a nonprofit called the hockey foundation and I reached out to them. I was in, in India for a personal trip. It was a, a wedding of a friend of mine. I looked up hockey to see if there's hockey there. I had no idea. Found this organization called the Hockey Foundation. Um, reached out to them. Basically, for about 10 years before that, they had been donating equipment to this area and growing hockey there and helped help them found their men's and women's national programs and uh, was bringing coaches in to help develop the game. And I got involved with them. Uh, ended up ended up going over to Ladakh, India, uh, which is up in the, the Himalayas. And there's like natural outdoor ice in the winter for about three months a year. And there's like this tiny little town. It's not tiny, but there's like a small town called Leh, L-E-H, in Ladakh, India, like right south of the border, like kind of between Pakistan and Tibet. And there's like over 2,000 hockey players there. And it's, <laughs> it's insane. <laughs> And it's so awesome. And they skate on frozen rivers and frozen, like anywhere there's frozen water, there's, there's, there's teams practicing and there's kids p- playing and adults playing. It's like what they do all winter long. And so I went, I went over there and like played in a, a, a kind of an, a fundraising event, but then also coached a couple, like coached some kids and ran some clinics. And I coached uh, the Indo Tibetan border police team is like a military hockey team. Uh, like I ran practice for them and talked to their coach about strategies and stuff. And it was like, the most surreal thing ever being up in the Himalayas for hockey. So that one, like, I can't zoom. imagine, <laughs> I can't imagine the view from those frozen rivers. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, that's amazing. It was wild. Yeah. It was all part of like a, it was like a fundraising event that they flew boards in because the, there was no boards in the country of India. It was all like, they're just playing natural ice. And the, the, the hindrance they had was once they got to like IHF tournaments to represent India, um, they didn't know how to play in like a real rink. Like they could play, but they'd never played in like a real rink. And so this organization wanted to bring in boards and donate them to the main club in the city so they could play in an actual rink to like progress. That was like the next step in their progression. And so we had to like, we bought these these, these boards um, in Europe and then like the Indian government flew them in and dropped them off and they set them up. And we had a charity game, like a fundraiser game to pay for it all. That was the Guinness world record, like hockey game played at the highest elevation and so we played a game uh it was like a whole week-long event but there's one game that was played at like over fourteen thousand feet and like we had oxygen on the bench and it was crazy short shifts all- right short shifts super short shifts like 20 second shifts and you're gassed um but yeah so i played in that game and and you know the, the boards are there in india now it's a couple of years back and um, but that place like blew me away. Like Lay was one of the coolest places I've ever been because walking around a city square, like an open market with like spices and, and, you know, clothing and food up for sale all over the place, you know, Tibetan, uh, like prayer flags flying. And then there's like kids walking down the street with a hockey stick and skates on the back. And it was just like the most surreal scene I've ever been in. That's awesome. Well, one more serious question before we have uh, some quick rapid fire to wrap, wrap up the okay. interview. Uh, on top of everything else we've discussed, you're also the USA Hockey's coach in chief for Montana and part of the USHL's central scouting while also raising two young hockey players yourself. I don't know how uh, you have any time to sleep, but with your sons and all of your coach, with your sons in mind and all of your coaching and playing experience in mind, uh, what advice would you give a young hockey player nowadays? I. Uh... My my advice for you know it'll be for my for my young boys and and for any other young players is just to is just to play and enjoy it and love it and not take it too seriously. Um, and I think it would be the same advice for coaches and parents too. But um, you know just being able to like develop a love for the game and and be able to take away things from that game through that love of the game. But really, it's just like it's not overdo it. Not don't you know you got to be careful of the burnout factor. And I, like, I never want to push my kids into it. Like naturally just by being around the game so much, they love it already. So hopefully that keeps continuing, but if they one day decide they don't want to, that's okay. But, um, you know, my advice is just to, you know, like if you love the game, just, just go out and play, don't overthink it, you know, invest in it and and love it and, and good things will come out of it. I love it. That was actually, uh, once again, very similar advice to Topher last week, which I mean, I think, 
makes a lot of sense, right? For especially for people that continue to be in the game like us as adults, although we're not signed to pro contracts. Um, I mean, I think it's just such a necessary proponent to uh, continuing to contribute to the game. I mean, both grow as a player, but then you know to stay involved later, like you said, as a coach as well. But all right, before we wrap it up, just some rapid fire coming at you. Oh. <laughs> All right, on the blade of your stick, black or white tape? Uh, I've always been, so I've always been a black tape guy. And I've recently changed to white because I've been shooting indoors more. So I like am not beating up the, uh, the shooting tiles as much. But usually I'm a black tape. White on top, black on the bottom. All right, fair enough. Uh, you get to have dinner with one current and one former NHL coach. Who would they be? uh current i think i would like to talk with uh cooper i'd love that i had a beer with him once a couple years back and he kind of he's so interesting to me because of his career path from like yeah. lawyer to like tier th- like high school to nhl within a couple of years right um so he fascinates me i think um former coach i'd love to talk with uh scotty bowman like a, just a legend and i yeah. think there's a, it's a no-brainer for me <laughs> all right favorite hockey stick from your playing days so i imagine there weren't too many one pieces back then right like i got my first one piece like later in my college career like when the eastern synergies first came out like yeah. the first gen like classic silver like, classic silver i had one of those like my junior or senior year of college but uh my like my go-to for a long time were those sherwood 50 30 wood wood sticks but the stick i loved the most was the I don't even remember the name, but it was like an Easton. Uh, it was the Easton, like Jeremy Roenick model. It was like blue with some like white, and it was all tapered, super thin on top. I don't even remember the name of the model, but it was by far my favorite. It was unreal. Interesting. <laughs> I got to look that one up. I'm, I uh, I pride myself on my stick knowledge from back in the day. You, you, you took me for a trip on that one. Yes. Yeah, so Let me do some it research. Jeremy Roenick's model, and it was like it was like a baby blue. With like white like silver like stripes but the, the blade was tapered so there's only one blade like multiple patterns but you had to get the exact eastern blade to fit in it but i would flip it upside down and put the blades in the butt and then like i would have it was like a uh, okay super thin shaft up top then which is why i loved it i remember that stick now that you say it i cannot think of a name but yeah, i definitely like, remember that like, look yeah in california like kids would grab like get it and then they would like cut the blades to fit in the little like mini yep. the small little thing but like everyone was like how'd you get that blade in there and i was like well you just flip it upside down <laughs> <laughs> yeah be smarter than the stick you know <laughs> yeah, uh, now, i love that thing <laughs> all right if you could interview any current nhl player for your podcast who would it be Ooh, current one um i think i would love to, to interview brent burns because that guy is so awesome like not only is a fantastic hockey player but like he is so like unique in his own way that i would love to see what he's all about <laughs> that would be a good one yeah. um all right last one for you name one country you haven't coached in yet but are dying to oh man there's so many um i think uh man i I have like six on the tip of my tongue, but, uh, you know, I, I would love to go and coach in, um, I think in, in Russia and not only for the cultural experience to see just kind of what it's all about, but also like, it's such a hockey, um, like a hockey hotbed and such like a traditional powerhouse that I would love to, um, go there and learn from like what it is like, you know, Sweden probably is the exact same way. Like I'd love to learn yeah. what those guys do to be so powerful. Um, but yeah. And then on the flip side from like, I, I have a, you know, a big spot in my heart for like the, the, the non-traditional countries, the up and comers. And that's like, there's so many that I want to go to that. Yeah. I'm hoping over the next couple of years, I can, I can start visiting some more awesome new up and coming hockey regions. Yeah. I have no doubt you will, especially all that uh, you're putting out online. But this has really been great, Pete. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, just appreciate all that you're continuing to contribute to the hockey community. Please let out everyone know where they can find you so they can stay up to date with Elevated Hockey and the Let's Go Hockey podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This has been a blast. I really appreciate it. I'm always up for talking hockey and anything that can hopefully 
help some people out there, whether it's you know entertaining or or hopefully helping with hockey, that that's a good thing in my eyes. So I appreciate you putting this out there. But uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions for me directly, like uh, they can they can find me uh, on Instagram at at elevated hockey. Um, shoot me a DM. I, I I love getting messages from players and other coaches and collaborating and and giving my opinion and and trying to get opinions of others. So at elevated hockey on Instagram. Uh, the new podcast is at Let's Go Hockey Podcast on Instagram, and that's also available on um, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Um, so those are the two main places. Yeah, and then online at uh, ElevatedHockey.com is kind of a, my main website where I put up whatever clinics we've got going on, and uh, we'll link to some of those social things too. Awesome. We'll make sure to get the the links in the captions of the YouTube and podcasts and all that good stuff too, so people can find you. But Thanks again, Pete. Let's uh, definitely do this again sometime. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Fun talking with you. All right. Have a good one.